wide. No. No, I can't be here. I escaped. I was... Helios. You're still here too. Hello everyone, I'm TG and today I want to talk to you guys about weapons in Returnal. I was looking online and trying to find some guides out there on different weapon traits and how they all work, but I came up a little bit short. I see a lot of, you know, top 5 weapons in Returnal or best alt fires, etc. I couldn't really find any comprehensive guide of each weapon and all the traits that are attributed to that weapon, so I decided I'll make one myself. What I want to do is give you guys a comprehensive breakdown of each weapon's strengths and weaknesses, as well as explain all the different traits attributed to that weapon, and then give the weapon a rating out of 5. I'm also going to touch on what the best weapon is for each boss and why, as well as go over all the different alt fires that you'll see on your journey. I'm also going to be leaving the timestamps down below, so if you guys want to jump to a specific weapon, feel free. Lastly, I just want to note that a lot of this is going to be my opinion, but you guys have to remember that with the right traits, any weapon can be devastating. There's no one weapon that's better than any other. Some of them excel in different situations, but overall, it's all about finding what meshes with your playstyle. What weapon makes you feel the most comfortable? So, let's get started. Now before we get to each weapon, we're going to talk about the ever important alt fires. Now if you guys know about alt fires already, go ahead and skip to the next section. The first alt fire I want to talk about is Blast Shell. Blast Shell is pretty straightforward. You're going to fire an explosive shell ahead of you in an arc that does moderate damage in an AoE. It's enough damage to kill standard enemies, but it excels more at taking care of large groups of weak enemies. It has an average cooldown, but the range leaves a little bit to be desired. Blast Shell's aiming arc drops off surprisingly close, so you really have to be right next to your enemy if you want to guarantee a hit. Overall, it's kind of lost sitting in the middle of the pack versus some of the more useful and powerful alt fires that you'll find down the line. Next is Doombringer, and Doombringer is God Tier. After a brief startup, you'll fire a sphere that travels slowly down a line until it hits something. All the while damaging enemies close to it until it explodes in a crescendo, doing huge damage to whatever it slams into. Not only does Doomringer do massive damage whenever it explodes, but the damage that it does along the way is enough to kill almost any small enemy. The range it has is basically unlimited because it's just going to keep going until it hits something. So if you fire this off in a huge room, it's going to damage everything all the way until it hits the wall. All this is offset by the fact that it has the longest cooldown of any alt fire, and that's for good reason. But believe me, Doombringer is the type of alt fire that's a uh, drop what weapon you're using so you can use Doombringer kind of thing. Next is Horizontal Barrage, and what Horizontal Barrage does is fire a buffet of lasers in a horizontal line that will bounce off of walls and floors and enemies whenever it hits them. Now the damage it does is quite low, but so too is the cooldown attributed to it. However, where Horizontal Barrage really falls flat is the fact that it's affected by gravity. So whenever you shoot this thing off, it's immediately going to start arcing downwards, towards the floor, towards a pit, etc. And it's for this reason that I say the effective range of Horizontal Barrage is quite low. Overall, it's probably one of the least useful of all the alt fires, being even less useful than its brother, the Vertical Barrage. So I would say if you see this thing on a weapon, pass. Next is probably my personal favorite, Kill Sight. What Kill Sight does is fire off a super powerful, hyper accurate beam wherever you aim it, and it's basically going to kill anything you hit with it, save for mini bosses and bosses, of course. The damage of Kill Sight is basically unmatched, and the effective range is that of the Doom Ringer. It's gonna keep going until it hits something. You can snipe an enemy from across the map, and it's not gonna dip, it's not affected by gravity, it's gonna go where you aim it. 
Overall kill site, one of the best alt fires in the game. However, it's not the best in every situation. Lastly, its cooldown is relatively low, especially when you take into account the amount of power this thing packs. The only problem is if you miss your shot, you have essentially no second chance. Now let's talk about the proximity mine. And sorry, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, you guys just haven't been using it correctly. It's actually the sleeper alt fire. No, it's crap. It's complete garbage. If you have a weapon with it, do not hesitate to throw that weapon away and never think about it again. Its range is pitiful and affected by gravity. Its damage is absurdly low, especially when you take into account how hard it is to actually hit with. The only saving grace of this thing is it has a super short cooldown and you can actually fire off two of them, not that you'd want to. Now, when this thing flops out of your gun like a wet fish, one of two things will happen. Either by the grace of God, an enemy will step on it and do a small amount of damage, or what's more likely, the enemy will just walk around it because its hitbox is so small. However, what is slightly more useful is if you fire this thing off and then shoot it yourself because you can cause them to explode. However, like I said earlier, the range is so small that you're not likely to do any damage with it anyway. Next is the Shield Breaker. And what Shield Breaker does is fire a moderate damage laser off that will destroy any shield that it touches, which means you can use this thing in place of melee to destroy the shield on turrets and other enemies. The damage and cooldown are both in the medium range, but where this thing kind of shines is in its long range. So it basically acts like a weaker version of kill shot. It has the same kind of beam that isn't affected by gravity and it'll go exactly where you shoot it. Overall, the shield breaker is great at what it does, but it kind of gets outclassed in other situations by other more useful alt fires. So for this reason alone, I would say don't really worry too much about losing this thing. You can go ahead and pick up a weapon with a different alt fire. Next is another favorite of mine, Shockstream. Now, Shockstream is pretty unique whenever you compare it to the other alt fires. First of all, it's close range and it's a charged attack, which means you have to constantly hold down the fire button in order for it to work. So what's unique about this is you can actually let go of the fire button and reposition. So you can interrupt your shock stream. You have a grand total of 10 seconds since the first time you press the fire button until the cooldown starts to trigger. And the reason for this is because you're in melee range, a lot of the time you're gonna be in danger, you're gonna need to dodge or reposition, etc. But just keep in mind that that countdown on Shockstream is going whether or not you're firing. It does moderate to high damage over time as long as you're holding the button down. However, the range is really where this thing falls short. You do have to be almost right beside the enemy and a lot of times that can put you in some hot water. But where this thing shines is for low health small enemies that spawn quickly like those we see in Biome 6. And to top everything off, the cooldown is moderate. So the shock stream, not for the faint of heart, very fun to use though, and it can be very effective. Next is probably the most strange and unique of all the alt fires, Tendril Pod. Similar to the proximity mine, Tendril Pod can be fired twice and has a very, very short cooldown. It also has a rather short range that is affected by gravity. It's going to arc again, similar to the proximity mine, but I think you're going to get just a little bit more use out of it. At first, I wrote off the Tendril Pod, but I was doing some experimentation with it, and it's actually not only fun to use, but pretty powerful as well. When you fire this thing off, it can stick to enemies, and it can stick to walls. And what it does is kind of act like a turret, in a sense, a short-range turret. It'll use the tendrils to attack any enemies that come next to it, and if you're using it on an enemy, all the other enemies that group up with that enemy will get damaged as well. And it actually does a fair chunk of damage. Overall, it's not really the most easy alt fire to use, but I do encourage you guys to practice with it a little bit because you can really get some good kills using this bad boy. Next, we have the overwhelmingly average Tracker Swarm. What Tracker Swarm does is fire off a barrage of homing lasers at whatever enemy you are aiming at. It has quite the long range. It'll go wherever you shoot it and home in. However, the damage it does is pretty lackluster. It also has a relatively low cooldown. Now, what Tracker Swarm's 
pretty good at is skirmishing with the enemy. So when you're constantly on the move being chased, Tracker Swarm can be a quick way to take one or two enemies down to give you a little bit of breathing room. It fires quickly, it aims automatically, and it gives you a chance to get out of there and reposition. Tracker Swarm is something I'm happy to use, but it's never something that I'm on the lookout for or that I would drop my weapon for just so I could have it. Next we have Vertical Barrage, and Vertical Barrage is slightly more effective than its counterpart Horizontal Barrage simply for the fact that it's not affected by gravity to the same degree. It has quite a larger range, and it doesn't start to dip off until much, much farther, unlike Horizontal Barrage, where it is immediate. It does about the same amount of damage as Horizontal Barrage, but it's going to seem like it does more, because you're going to hit more often and more enemies with it, if that makes sense. It excels against bigger, tougher enemies, because it's a lot easier to hit them with it, as opposed to the smaller flying enemies, because you're only going to have a vertical line to aim with, so sometimes that can be a little disorienting and hard to do. Finally, it has a cooldown that's virtually identical to the Horizontal Barrage, and overall, this is another one that I'm happy to use, but it's not something that I keep my eyes out for. Finally, I'm going to talk about Void Beam. Now, Void Beam is a lot of people's favorites, and it's very, very powerful. I love using it. It used to be my favorite, but let's break it down. It's basically a long range version of Shock Stream. It functions identically. You start it, you can stop it to reposition, etc. And you have a total of 10 seconds to use it, regardless of if you're holding the fire button down or not. It does continuous huge damage to whatever you're hitting with it, and it has a long range. It's gonna go where you want it to go. It excels at defeating enemies before they get anywhere near you. It's another one of those abilities that I would drop what I'm using just so I could use Void Beam, not only because it's fun, but because it's absurdly useful as well. It's fantastic as a precision artillery strike against strong monsters across the map. And overall, it has quite a long cooldown, but believe me, it is most definitely worth it. So that does it for alt fires. Now we're going to talk about each individual weapon's strengths, weaknesses, and we're going to break down all the different traits of the weapons and what they do. So the first weapon I'm going to talk about is the starter pistol, the modified sidearm. And a lot of people don't give this thing the time of day, but believe me, don't count this little guy out. With the right combination of traits, it can actually be pretty devastating. It functions as a little bit of an all-arounder. Operating at a medium range, it's fast, it's reliable, and it's accurate. Now, a lot of people dump this as soon as they see another weapon, but be mindful of the traits that you have on it, because there's a few that stick out that might make you think twice on whether or not you want to put this baby down. But let's talk about traits. First is homing missile. Very straightforward, this just replaces your standard shot with a homing missile that can track down targets. Next is Ricochet, which means all your bullets are going to bounce off of targets and walls whenever they hit them. Then we have Snub Nose Barrel. Now this one's important because it gives up a little bit of accuracy and range for greatly increased damage. Next is Piercing, and of course Piercing just means your shots are going to travel through the enemies that you hit to hit enemies behind. And then we have another very important one, Burst Fire which sacrifices a little bit of weapon control in order to launch extra projectiles every time that you shoot. Then there's shrapnel, which causes your shots to have a 50% chance to explode on hit. Next is charging shot. So this is going to make every shot much, much more powerful, but you're going to have to charge for about half a second before you fire. Finally, we have serrated projectiles, which causes your rounds to deal damage over time and hit reload, which means your weapon has a chance of instantly reloading every single time you hit a target. So as you can see, there's some traits that can really transform your modified sidearm into a devastating force. I would say you want to keep your eye out for a weapon that has shrapnel, serrated projectiles, homing missile, and hit reload. 
all of those will work in conjunction to really give you a powerful gun. Next, we're going to look at the Tachyomatic Carbine. Now, the Tachyomatic Carbine is another all-rounder, but overall, I think it's just a little bit better than the modified sidearm overall, and that's because it has a bit of a longer range. Now, this is a weapon that is very, very beginner-friendly. In fact, the first time you pick up the Tachyomatic Carbine, you're probably going to think, I'm only using the Tachyomatic Carbine from now on. Unfortunately, that will not be the case because as you go and see more and more weapons later on, you'll kind of see how the carbine doesn't really excel in any area over another. It's pretty much a jack of all trades, master of none. Whenever I find a carbine, I kind of think, meh, there it is. But as always, the traits are what matters, so let's talk about them. First, we have armor piercing. This will cause your shots to punch through enemies and ricochet off surfaces after that. Then there's critical hit, which just gives each shot a chance to do more damage, and hardened, which overall increases your protection while you hold the weapon. Now the next two are kind of counterproductive when working together. There's high caliber, which will sacrifice your fire rate for much more damage, and then there's rising pitch, which causes your weapon to fire faster as you hold down the fire button. But then we have payload rounds, which causes enemies to explode in a little AoE whenever you kill them. And then leech rounds, which heal your integrity every shot that connects. Lastly, we have hyper accurate, which significantly reduces the recoil of each shot and accelerated, which means every time you kill an enemy, you're going to have a decreased cooldown on your dash and your fire rate is going to have a little bit of a boost. Now, as you've probably guessed, I don't often go on the lookout for a carbine, but whenever I do use it, I like to match accelerated with hyper accurate leech rounds and payload rounds. That's going to give you a good overall boost to pretty much everything that you want boosted, and you're going to be able to get everything done that you want. However, like I said, you're not going to be able to really excel when it comes to one specific area. Next, let's talk about the Poop Maw Crapper. I'm sorry, the Spit Maw Blaster. <laughs> Honestly though, the first time through, I was definitely Team Spit Maw because the Spit Maw Blaster is so powerful early on. Whenever you find it, it is absolutely devastating. But the farther into the game you get, the more the Spit Maw Blaster just falls short at every turn. Once again, don't forget, with the right traits, anything can be devastating. I'm just talking in a general sense. What really holds the Spit Maw back is its range. It has the shortest range of any weapon in Returnal because it's essentially a shotgun. But even if you're using Narrow Maw, which will cause your shots to go much, much farther and still do damage, when compared to other guns that function at a medium range to long range, there's just no reason to keep the Spit Maw. That being said, let's talk about the traits. The first of which is Slugshot. Basically, Slugshot just adds an additional shot right down the middle of your sights that deals big damage. Next is Wide Maw, which increases the spread of the blaster by a huge margin, but it also increases damage. That might sound good, but really you're going to get a lot more use out of Narrow Maw, which makes the spread much, much tighter, causing you to be able to use pinpoint accuracy more or less from a short to medium range. Next, there's Rapid Spitter, and that just basically turns the Spit Maw Blaster into an automatic weapon, allowing you to fire off shots much, much faster. And then there is Explosive Spit, and this causes shots to detonate on impact after they hit a certain distance. Moving down the line, we have Critical Stagger, and Critical Stagger basically means your shots are just going to do more damage to staggered enemies, whereas Backsplash causes every pellet of your shell that hits an enemy to have about a 30% chance to replenish your ammo. Lastly, there's Piercing Spit, which just causes your shots to pierce through enemies and explode behind them, and Acid Clouds, which leaves a cloud of acid that damages enemies around each of your shots. 
obviously I don't go after the spit maw quite so often, but when I do, I like to turn it into a maximum damage glass cannon kind of thing, and I go for slug shot, rapid spitter, narrow maw, and backsplash. Next, it's time to talk about the Pyro Shell Caster. Now, the Pyro Shell Caster is probably one of those weapons that most people don't know too much about because in my research, I couldn't find any guides on the entire internet breaking down the traits for this weapon. So hopefully, I can shed a little bit of light on it and let you guys know how this weapon works. Now, that being said, the Pyro Shell Caster is a little bit underwhelming in my opinion. It functions at a medium range and what it does is shoot an explosive round in an arc that is affected by gravity. Anything that it hits, it will explode. It does moderate damage, but it's whenever you get to the higher level traits that you're really going to see this thing kind of shine. When you first pick it up with those lower level traits, it's nothing really to write home about. In regards to traits, the first is Streamline Chamber. And what this does is just simply increase the weapon's rate of fire. Next is Secondary Explosion. Now this will shoot out a secondary shot that explodes just like your original shot. And then there's Bouncy Projectiles, which simply means your shot is going to bounce before it explodes. Then there's Sticky Bonus, which is just going to cause your shots to stick to whatever they hit before they explode. And then Seeking Flares, which is going to add a slight homing to every shot that you fire. Now the next two are very straightforward. There's Enlarge Chamber, which is just going to increase the size of your magazine, and Anti-Gravity Projectiles, which is going to remove the arc from your fire, meaning everything that you shoot is going to be in a straight line. And finally, there's Auxiliary Projectiles, which is going to fire off an additional explosive shot that will explode in conjunction with your original shot and Simmering Explosion, which causes all your shots to have a damage over time effect as well. Overall, when I use the Pyro Shell Caster, what I'm trying to accomplish is taking out groups of enemies en masse. So what I like to use is Sticky Bonus, Seeking Flares, Anti-Gravity Projectiles, and Auxiliary Projectiles. I find that this setup gives me the control that I need, but also doesn't sacrifice too much damage. Next we have the Coil Spine Shredder, and this one? This is one that I totally underestimated the first time through. The Coil Spine Shredder is very very unique in Returnal. It functions like nothing else. It fires flying discs that can be charged up for more damage. It has a variable range, and when I say that, I mean it can be used at both close and long range to the exact same effect. It's kind of like a shotgun that works at any range. The interesting thing is it only has one disc to fire, and then you need to reload. But believe it or not, it can actually be fired quite quickly if you master its overload pattern. You'll quickly get into a flow of shooting, overload, shooting, overload, where you'll be able to do that like clockwork, especially whenever you get to the higher adrenaline levels. But as always, it's all about the traits, and the coil spine has some interesting ones. So let's take a look. First and foremost, we have alt fire cooling. Simply, this reduces the cooldown of your alt fire. Next is shattering discs. This just causes the discs that you fire to shatter and do additional damage to the enemy. And then there is adrenaline discs, which gives you a 50% chance upon hit to get a little bit of extra adrenaline. Next is the ever important enlarged chamber. And this just gives you two discs as opposed to one, making your rate of fire that much faster. Next is Twin Discs, which will fire a second, smaller, damaging disc in addition to your original disc. And then we have Retarget, which functions like a lot of the other weapons retarget trait, which will just cause your disc to damage an additional target. And Splitting Disc will cause your disc to break off and hit another target as well. Finally, we have Enhanced Charge, which means every time you charge up your fire, it's going to do even more damage than it originally would. And Negating Discs, 
which causes the projectiles that you shoot to destroy enemy projectiles. Overall, I would say the Coil Spine Shredder, probably more than any other weapon on this list, is very dependent on the traits in order to be viable. So if you're wondering what I think the god rolls on this would be, it's Adrenaline Discs, Shattering Discs, Retarget, and Splitting Discs. It's time to talk about the Thermogenic Launcher. Now, the Thermogenic Launcher is one of my favorites. It has raw firepower that's pretty much unmatched whenever you stack it up against any other weapon on this list, but it has a small magazine and your projectiles don't travel very fast. You really gotta have some crackerjack accuracy to make this thing work. So as always, we're gonna talk about traits first because the Thermogenic Launcher has got some really, really cool ones. First on the list is easy to use. This just means your kills are going to reward extra proficiency. Next is Oblite Magnet, which just causes Oblites to automatically be gathered whenever you kill an enemy. Then we have Critical Rockets. And this means your projectiles have just a small chance to explode twice. It's somewhere in the range of 30 to 40%. The next one should look familiar. It's in Large Chamber. It's just going to give you a bigger magazine. And then we have Replicating Hits, which causes your homing rockets to shoot off an extra homing rocket for a little bit more damage. Next is a little bit of naughty bad fun. First is Mega Rocket. This causes your rockets to instead become one powerful rocket, and Full Auto is going to turn this thing into a machine gun rocket launcher. To cap things off, we have Thermite Rockets, which causes your rockets to do additional damage over time, and Tail Fire, which fires an additional, even more powerful rocket at the end of your shot. So overall, I think the Thermogenic Launcher is actually a little bit more difficult to use than the other weapons, but whenever you do use it, you're really gonna see some great results. What I like to use is Tail Fire, Replicating Hits, Full Auto, and Critical Rockets. That way, I can do all kinds of burst damage up front and give myself a little bit of breathing room. Now we're getting to the good stuff. I'm going to talk about the Electro Pylon Driver. Now the Electro Pylon Driver is one of those weapons where as soon as I picked it up, I said, you know what? I ain't going back. I was team Electro Pylon Driver for life. All the other weapons meant nothing to me. And I'm sure a lot of people were out there thinking the same thing. And that's simply because it's such a strong weapon that doesn't rely on its traits to be good. No matter what you roll on this thing, it's going to get the job done. You're going to be able to take care of almost all the enemies, all the bosses, and you're just going to feel good about using it. I would say it's unique in the sense that when you see an Electro Pylon Driver, the only thing you're looking at is the damage. You don't even really care necessarily what the traits are. But let's talk about those traits anyway. First, we have Oblite Extractor, and this is just going to cause enemies to drop more Oblites. Then we have Scyphium Extractor, which is going to cause enemies to drop more Scyphium. Then we have what I think is probably the most valuable trait on this weapon, which is Pylon Web. This is going to cause you to fire all your pylons at the same time in a web that's going to start doing big damage over time. Then we have Finisher, which is going to cause the Electro Pylon Driver to do more damage when enemies health is at 30% and below and Streamline Chamber, which just increases your fire rate overall. Moving on, there's Enlarged Chamber, which is going to increase the size of your magazine, and Blade Harmonizer, which is going to cause your melee attacks to do more damage whenever you're using the Electro Pylon Driver. Lastly, there's Blade Pulse, which makes your melee hits trigger a damaging pulse from the pylons that you've already shot, and admittedly, you're probably never actually going to be able to see that in action, and protective pylons, which will increase your protection by 25% whenever you're standing in a pylon's range. So overall, like I said earlier, these traits are kind of lackluster, but you don't have to worry about them too much. That being said, if I had my way, I would use finisher, pylon web, streamline chamber, and protective pylons. 
That way, you're pretty much untouchable and you're doing a huge chunk of damage with every shot. Now it's finally time to talk about the mighty weapon of war, the Rot Gland Lobber. And I know many of you are probably like, what are you talking about? But stay with me for a sec. The Rot Gland Lobber, although it comes off in the beginning as pretty weak, if you stick with it, this thing is going to be your go-to weapon going forward. It is so good. It's like a combination of the Coil Spine Shredder and the Electro Pylon Driver, but even better. Unlike the Electro Pylon, it does a big amount of damage up front, and it also has that damage over time that makes the Electro Pylon so great. And with the right traits, I would say the Rot Gland probably has the highest damage cap of any weapon in the game. Or at the very least, you're going to be able to take down big enemies faster than you would with any other weapon. So let's talk about those traits, shall we? First, we have Bouncing Rot. This causes your projectiles to bounce before they explode. Next is Trailing Rot. This causes your shots to leave a trail of rot on the ground that damages enemies. And then we have Durable Rot, which just increases the duration of the rot pools that are left around the area. Next we have Explosive Rot, which causes your shots to explode on impact. And another familiar one in Large Chamber, which increases the size of your magazine to two shots instead of one. Then we have Caustic Rot, which causes your shots to do even more damage over time than they usually do, and Protective Rot, which is very similar to the Electro Pylon Driver. Standing in the Rot gives you a 25% boost to your protection. Finally, we have two unique and exciting ones. There's Portal Rot, which causes enemies killed by your Rot to create projectile firing portals, and Tendril Rot, which causes tendrils to come out of the ground, out of the rot that you fire, functioning similarly to the alt fire tendril pod. So overall, as you can see, the Rockland Lobber is kind of god tier, and if I had my way, I would want durable rot, explosive rot, caustic rot, and portal rot on my weapon. That way, you're doing this huge amount of damage with your initial shot, but also... You can kind of play a little bit of hide and seek and just let the gun do the work for you while you focus on something else. My advice to you is to drop whatever you're using, especially in biomes 4, 5, and 6, if you have at least two of these traits on your Rockland Lobber, because they're really going to get the job done, and you have to see it to believe it. Next, we got a nice little bit of crumpet, the Hollow Seeker. Now, the Hollow Seeker is basically the best weapon in Returnal. In my opinion, I like the Rockland Lobber better, but overall, I think the Hollow Seeker takes the cake. It's good at everything. It's got the range, it's got the sustained damage, it's got the magazine, and it's got some pretty awesome traits that are really going to bring the pain, especially against bosses. In my opinion, the Hollow Seeker is the Returnal standard issue. If you see it, pick it up. It's going to do what you need it to do. It's going to shoot where you need it to shoot, and things are going to go boom. So let's talk about the traits on this weapon, and almost all of them are 5 out of 5. There isn't a specific trait on the Hollow Seeker that I would say is garbage, and that's not true for any of the other weapons, but let's take a look. So first we have retarget. This one should look familiar. Every time you hit something, your projectiles are going to seek out another target. Then we have phasing rounds, which causes your projectiles to go through surfaces. And we have waves, which fire an additional wave while you're firing the entire time. Moving on, we have serrated projectiles, which causes your shots to do damage over time. And shrapnel, which causes your shots to explode on impact, doing even more damage. Then we got some fun ones. There's Portal Beam, which creates a beam firing portal that targets nearby enemies, and Split Stream. So this is going to fire off homing lasers in addition to your regular shots. And finally, we have Portal Turret, which functions similar to Portal Beam. It creates a projectile firing portal that targets nearby enemies, and Oscillator. This is going to change up your attack pattern and do more damage. 
So like I said earlier, all of these traits are pretty much amazing. But in a perfect world, I would say Portal Turret, Retarget, Portal Beam, and Split Stream are just fantastic. It's so much damage and your clip is so big that you're just going to melt absolutely anything. And that's that. So last and certainly not least is Dreadbound. Now Dreadbound functions completely different from every other weapon in the game. It doesn't have an overload, so it has no need to reload. What it does have, however, are projectiles that bounce off whatever you hit and come back to your clip. So you can only fire when those projectiles are back in your clip. If they're out damaging enemies, you gotta wait and you can't do any more damage. It's very, very strange and it's tough to get used to, but once you get it down, it's actually not so bad. Obviously, just because of how the weapon functions, it's better at short range than it is at long range because if you're firing off in a distance, it's going to take a long time for those projectiles to come back to you. So typically, you want to get up close and personal to do the most damage. Now, when you are up close and personal, Dreadbound's damage is amazing. There's nothing that even comes close because you fire so fast, even faster than the shots in a Hollow Seeker. But simply because of its operational range, it doesn't rank quite as high. Now the traits, the traits are going to make and break the Dreadbound. You have to have a very, very certain set of traits for this thing to really be powerful. First, we have Staggering. This is just going to increase the staggering power of each shot. Then we have Oblite Magnet, which simply increases the range at which you pick up Oblites. And Fourth Shard. This one's pretty important because it's going to give you a fourth shot in your clip, allowing you to do more damage faster. Next, there's expanding shards, and this is just going to increase the size of your projectiles and increase the damage that they do the farther that they travel. Then there's protection steel, and this one's kind of cool. It's pretty unique. Every hit is going to give you a temporary small boost to protection whenever your projectile comes back to your clip. Next, we have a set of pretty important ones. There's Explosive Shards, which causes your projectiles to explode upon impact, and Returning Damage, which causes your shots to deal damage both when they hit an enemy and when they're flying back to your clip. Finally, there's Oblite Generator, which gives you extra Oblites every time you hit an enemy, and Damage Steal. This functions similar to Protection Steal, except instead of bonus protection, you're getting bonus damage. Now, overall, the Dreadbound, you can run it a couple of different ways because as you'll notice, there's a lot of things that give you more Oblites or they give you protection, etc. I like to go straight damage, of course, so I go for returning damage, explosive shards, fourth shard, and damage steal. That way, when I'm using this thing and I'm up close and personal, I'm basically unmatched damage-wise. So with all that said, before I go, let's talk a little bit about what the best weapons are for each boss. Now I'm going to take into account a few things here. I'm going to be talking as if this is your first playthrough because upon subsequent playthroughs you're going to have access to better gear, better weapons, better augments, etc. So if you're going in dry, this is my personal recommendation for each boss what weapon you should use to help you get by quickly and easily. But quick disclaimer, some of the video that you're going to see is going to be me using a different weapon. So do as I say, not as I do. I just want to show you guys the mechanics of each boss. First, let's talk about Frike. And that's right, it's Frike. It's not Frike. Believe me, I'm a doctor. Now old Frike, he's a little bit of an asshole, especially early on, because he's your first big challenge. And he's tougher than anything that you've faced up to this point. Now, what I advise using the first time through is the Spitmaw Blaster. This is the one time that I'm going to say the Spitmaw is the way to go, but this is only going to work if you do happen to roll Narrow Maw on it. Now, the reason I say the Spitmaw Blaster is the way to go in this fight is because for the first phase, Frike is going to be at a medium to long range, but going forward after that, he's going to constantly be teleporting over to you with a big old swing from his fist. So the Spitmaw is great 
for doing big damage up close and on your way back as you retreat from his melee swings. The most important thing that you can do is learn his melee swing pattern. Basically, when you see him come towards you, you're going to have to jump and dash away. That way you dodge his strike and you can get some shots in with your spit maw. And after a while, that's it. Next, we got Ixion. And Ixion's pretty difficult. It took me quite a few attempts my first time through. I managed to eke by on Frike, but Ixion, no dice. What I advise using for Ixion is the Tachyomatic Carbine. Now, a lot of people say Hollow Seeker is the way to go, but at this point in the game, you're not going to have the traits on the Hollow Seeker that make it so powerful. So the Tachyomatic Carbine is a nice balanced way to do it, as he's constantly going to be at a long range, and you're going to need a weapon that can do damage from far away. So you absolutely never want to be up close when fighting Ixion, because He's just going to be shooting off barrage after barrage of crazy lasers that are so hard to dodge whenever you're up close. So you want to get some range and a lot of his attacks shoot him far away as well. So like I said, you need something that is hyper accurate and the tachyomatic carbine is that. Next is Nemesis. Now Nemesis, you can go about this one of two ways. Number one is to use the Hollow Seeker, which at this point in the game, you're going to start to learn is your very best friend because you're going to have some traits on it that are very, very good at the range. But if you are super accurate, if you're confident in your accuracy, pick up the launcher because the launcher does huge amounts of damage in a very short amount of time. And a lot of the time with Nemesis during his second and third phase, he's going to appear and disappear and you're not going to have much time to lay down fire. The Hollow Seeker, it's consistent, but it's not going to do as much damage as if you're very, very accurate with the thermogenic launcher. Do not make the mistake of going into this battle like I did the first time with a short range weapon. Me and my little spit maw with wide maw, by the way, did not stand a chance. I died and I died very, very badly. Next, you'll do battle with my favorite boss in the entire game, Hyperion. Now for Hyperion, it is Hollow Seeker every time. 10 times out of 10, you want to use that Hollow Seeker because the entire fight you're going to be at range. And as long as you are strafing left and right and dodging occasionally, you're going to be able to consistently hold down that fire button. So the Hollow Seeker is great because it has such a large clip. And if you got something like Portal or Shrapnel on it, you're going to do that much more damage. It makes the whole fight kind of a piece of cake. The only thing I would say about this fight that's kind of not cool is that it's over so fast because Hyperion is quite easy. But like I said, go ahead, give it a try yourself using the Hollow Seeker and see how it goes. And finally, the last fight in the game, Afion. There's again two ways you can go about this. The first, and quite frankly, the easiest, is if you go for the Electro Pylon Driver because this thing just melts him, it's going to shoot the pylons off and they're just constantly going to tick away, do damage, do damage, especially if you have the pylon web trait. That being said, I have seen people use the coil spine shredder that just absolutely decimate him. And when I say decimate him, I mean his bars go down in less than 5 seconds. Obviously, if that's what you're going to do, you need high damage on that coil spine. You also need shattering discs, retarget splitting discs and twin discs so if you somehow find that god roll coil spine please pick it up use it against Afion. but if not stick with the electro pylon driver so ladies and gentlemen boys and girls that was my comprehensive breakdown of all the weapons all the alt fires and all the weapon traits in returnal i hope you guys enjoyed this video i hope it helped you guys out just a little bit and if it did Leave a comment below, let me know what your favorite weapon is, what traits you like to run on it, and of course, if it was helpful, go ahead and like this video for future reference. It just would fill my heart with glee to know that this helped you guys out. So as always, I'm TG. If you like what you saw, you know what to do. Keep it sleazy.